What's going on, everyone? It's LFC Transfer Room here, and we are ready for a miracle in Atalanta. You know, we're, we're coming to the end of, of, of Klopp's tenure, and if there is going to be one more magical night, it's not going to be at Anfield. Or it, well, it may, we may have another one at Anfield, but it looks like we're going to have to have an incredibly magical night on the road in Italy, and we we need to talk about it. We need to build our starting eleven. We need to talk about a couple of things that we th- I think have got us here, and to help me do that, I've got Man- uh, Mandon and Paul. Don't know how I've done that. <laughs> Brandon and Paul, Mandon, even how are you? Sir? I'm doing all right. Brandon the Mandon, I guess, is what we can do with. Uh, yeah, I'm doing all right. Ready for uh, get into it today. Paul. Oh yeah, I'm doing fine. Pessimistic, pragmatist. You know what? I'm a little bit optimistic, primarily because I don't think we have much to lose. So when we don't have much to lose, I I don't feel nervous going into the game. You know, you start expecting to lose. So if you come out winning, then you'll be ecstatic. So I'm, I'm doing okay, to be honest. No, we're in a tricky situation. Uh, and I, I'm not going to sit here and sort of pin the tail on the donkey and say they're to blame. Them, they're they're to blame them. Them. But I think we were in a situation where FSG took an action to t- put up ticket prices without sufficient consultation with the fans. So that came as a shock to the fans. The fans then reacted by removing the flags from the stadium, um, which was then a counter reaction. And that created an atmosphere where we didn't score a goal at Anfield for the first time in, I think, nearly three years. So we've created a a system of action and counter reaction. And I think everyone's got a part to play in what's happened. But Brandon, do you think we're now in a situation where we've just got to forget that? all push in the same direction and go, right, if we're going to finish this era, this amazing era of Klopp on a positive note, everyone has to go in the same direction right now. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's It's been kind of the whole thing of the Klopp era is the unity of the fans and the club as one. And to see it kind of have this weird disintegration right at the end uh, when we're chasing so much, because it, it means not just, you know, obviously the Europa League's not what we want to be playing in, but since we're here, we better be winning it. And also would give Klopp absolutely every trophy we can win under him. So, I mean, there's so much at stake that uh, lets something like this kind of fracture what has been built over nine years has been slightly disappointing. Um, you would wish that removing flags from the stadium or something like that wouldn't have effect on players, professional players, but it did seem to have some sort of effect because that was, I said it in the chat that that was the worst Klopp performance I think it was worse than the Aston Villa 7-2 because that wasn't in front of fans who really cared. I know somebody said the uh, Napoli game where they absolutely throttled us, but at that point, that was a dead a team with dead legs playing against the team. At that point, was probably the best in Europe. Like uh, I, In my mind, that was the worst performance of the Klopp era. I mean, we made some Samaka, Skamaka, Skamaka. Scaramaka from um, look like a, a world class striker. I mean, we saw him at West Ham, Paul. It's it's it's, it's kind of a, a it's a weird way to get to this situation, isn't it? But we, we're here. We have to deal with what we have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It was it was an extremely disappointing performance. It's right up there for me with our five to a loss to to um to Real Madrid at Anfield a couple of seasons ago in that Champions League. Uh, to have scored two goals in that game, if you guys remember, we were leading 2 nothing in the Champions League semi-final against, against um, the best team in Europe. And then we just collapse and give up five goals. So this game was pretty close to that. Um, but as, as relates to the flags, I am not so sure if I want to put a whole lot of stock in that. Of course, when you're playing at home, you want to have everything go perfect. Uh, but these are professional players, you know, and once the game starts, irrespective of whatever problems we have with the fans, with the ticket prices, flags, etc., you would want to believe that the players on the on the on the field is professional enough to put in a to put in a shift, you know, and we just seem so lackadaisical. I'm wondering if it's a case where we were just underestimating the opponents and they just had their moments and the ball just go in. But, you know, I am, call me optimistic, but I 
think we have a decent chance of putting three, three past them tomorrow or more. Just a matter if can we keep them out, which is my worry. Yeah, I, th- I think my 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 thing with it is if everyone's not focused on the goal and everyone's thinking about different objectives, then we're all not moving in the same direction. And, and I think that, you know, I, I rate Anfield as one of the, the best atmospheres in European football. It on is. On a European night. It is. But when everyone's not pushing in the same direction, it creates that, well, what's going on? And, and it creates confusion. And then people start to focus on different ways. And I think that's that's part of, I, I, I agree the players should be more professional and they have just as much blame as any anyone else in this. But I, I think... Confusion creates disorientation. Disorientation creates lack of cohesion. Lack of cohesion creates tiredness. It's very natural for people in a protest and uh, when things are going on in terms, uh, and I say protest, not that Liverpool were formally protesting, but when action is taken, it's really, really common to see a mass disengagement of staff because people are confused as to what they should feel and think about a situation. I'm not going to go into it big HR talk about what um, employee action means uh, thing because this isn't employee, this is support. But anyway, mm-hmm. we're here, we're ready. We've we've done it, we've done it over there before. We've put five past them before, Brandon. Um, but I'm gonna start and I'm gonna ask the chat as well. Who needs to turn up? Because a couple of players haven't really turned up recently. Yeah. Um, who for you is the one that's got to just sort of turn into that mentality monster, turn into that beast, activate beast mode and sort of push the Liverpool end of season in the right direction? Who Who is it for you, Brandon? And, and let us know in the chat. My key would always be uh, Mo. It's got to be Mo. He's got to be the, you know, he's the elder statesman of that front line. He's been out of form, it feels like, for a little bit now. Um, if he's the one who's Leading by example, I mean, he opens up Darwin to do more Darwin things. He opens up so much more of the play down the right-hand side. It's got to be kind of the elder statement who has been a part of these kind of magical Liverpool years and really shows like, you know, those years aren't behind us. Those years are in front of you guys. It's going to be your night as well. I mean, I think Mo has got to be the number one key outside of, you know, whoever starts striker-wise just putting one ball in the back of the net, which would be, I think, a huge weight off most of our shoulders as a fan base. Yep. I mean, Paul, we're getting Mo, we're getting Van Dyke, we're getting Trent, we're getting, you know, a few names. I mean, for me, I was thinking probably Jota. Um, I think if anyone's going to turn up and, and ghost through that five-man defence, it's probably that guy. Who, who is it for you? Well, I, I think Jota has to start. But in any team sport, when when there's a crisis... You expect your big players to step up to the plate. There's a reason why our our high speed players are people like Salah, Van Dyke, Trent. You need these guys to step up for us to have every any chance. Of course, you have your complementary players who need to put in a shift and do their part. But you're not going to win in and progress in a game like this unless we get big big performances from our big players. So. For us to have any chance, Salah needs to roll back the clock a year or two and says, come guys, we're going to do this. Van Dyke needs to have that mentality that nothing is going to pass me. Right? We're going to keep a clean sheet today. And every and everybody else needs to feed off that. I need Jota to start. Normally, I would say Jota is better off the bench. But if we start Darwin and he, has, and he missed that first opportunity with us needing minimum three goals, and if he missed that first opportunity, you know, you don't know what it might do to him and the team psychology, so, you know. And you don't want a situation where players are, are, are thinking twice about passing to Darwin in the box because, you know, he's not, they're not sure if he's going to put the ball in the back of the net. They're going to try to do it themselves. So I would probably start Jota and say, listen, man, you don't have 90 minutes, but can you give me 50, 50 60 minutes? Give us two goals because... If we can go in halftime with a lead, say a one or two nothing lead, I think they will panic in the second half. So I am expecting big performances from our big players. If, of course, halftime we are down a goal or two and it's not going to happen, 
then you can take off these guys and say, you know what, let's move on. But I want to see the big players put in a shift tomorrow. There's big debates going on about, you know, Jota, Dom, the Sober Sly people are expecting. Endo can't start. I mean, and we'll, we'll get to the starting 11 soon, but he definitely had a stinker against Atlanta and they targeted him very heavily, like in terms of when he got the ball. Um, Robbo is going to struggle so much against the press. I actually think he's. He, this is one of those discussions, I think, where you've got a senior pro. Do you play Gomez there? I potentially play Robbo there just because you need that level of nastiness in an away game. And I think Robbo's got it in abundance. Um, let's let's build a back four. Let, let's build a back four uh, that we, we collectively agree on. Brandon, for you, who's your back four? Well, easy ones, obviously, Virgil. That's the, that's the spot on one that we don't have to talk about very much. Uh, Trent coming into the starting lineup, obviously, with Bradley out, there's no real question there. Um, Beside, I'd say probably, I mean, Kanate seems a little out of form, but I mean, how good he can be, I think you have to start him. And left-hand side, I go Robbo, kind of what you said, the shithouser in his game is kind of key when you're trying to really get underneath the opponents of skin to uh, get them to make mistakes, maybe play a bad back pass, something like that, you know, because Robbo's got in their head, just, you know, doing Robbo things. I think that would be my back four, Robbo, um, Konate, Virgil, and Trent. That's who I would go with as the back four. So we've got a uh, Gomez, Van Dyke, Ibu, Trent, which is their drop in Robbo. Um, Paul, for you, Wait. Uh, Robbo, so, Van Dyke, Fonza, Gomez. So are we... So we're assuming that it's going to be Allison, right? And not um... yeah, 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 might as well just park. <laughs> okay. that, that's happening, isn't it? Okay, okay. I don't well, care I... if he's on one leg. <laughs> okay, I, I disagree with Brandon in one one spot. I would start um, Kwanza. Yes, we know that Kwanza made that big error against Man United, but Kwanza to mm. me has been a little bit more consistent over the past month or two than Konate. He, I think, is a little bit more assured on the ball. And I always thought that he was not as quick as Konate, but I've seen, but I've changed my mind. I think he's really, really quick. And I think Kwanza, even after he had that stinker, that giveaway against Manu, for the rest of the game, he was massive, if you guys can remember. So I would start, well, Trent is a no-brainer. One, because... Um, and even if Bradley was available, I would still start Trent because we need some offense. Robbo, on the other side, absolutely. Gomez might be a better defender, but you don't worry about the better defender when you need minimum three goals. So it has to be Trent and, and, and Robbo. And I would start Verge and, and Kwanzaa. I think this, this is the thing, at least every, everyone's talking about Gomez and Gomez deserves a chance. Now, in my back four... I went, obviously I went with Allison. I've gone with Gomez, um, Canate, Van Dyke, and Robbo. Mm. Now, obviously I've left out Trent for a very specific reason. Um, and that's because I would, I, Trent wants to play in midfield. This is Klopp coming to the end. Yeah. If he wants to have that moment, that absolute leader moment where he sort of breaks into midfield and shows everyone what he's capable of, I think it's in a game like this. I think if you're going to make a take a risk and play in Trent in midfield, and I, 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 I wouldn't. And the reason I say, and you know, I, I kind of agree with you. I think Trent will probably play there, but what I will do is, and we'll move on to midfield. I would play a midfield three of Trent, Jones, and McAllister. Now I have logic for this, and the reason I'd do that is because McAllister at ten at four, DM. Yep, yeah, but I would. They can rotate. They can all rotate, and you really hard to man to man mark when you've got three rotating central midfielders popping up in different positions. And the reason I think it's Jones and not Sobersly is Jones and Trent know each other upside down, back to front, back and forwards. Their pressing numbers when it was the end of last season were off the chart. So I, I think if you were to play those three. Trent could drop in at DM. Jones knows how to drop in at DM and create a two. I think if you play Gomez at right back, he can come into sort of that DM position. I think you can create confusion. And this is more me thinking probably more about how Atalanta attack and press, thinking actually 
I would have three players that are really good at passing for 60 minutes. And then at 60 minutes, Soboslai, Elliot, good at running, create a completely different problem. So that's my midfield three. So my back four is that, but my midfield three is Trent Jones and McAllister, just because I want to kill the legs by having those mm. three just pinging the ball around. That's just mine. So, so at Brandon first, we'll come to you. Paul. Okay. Who's your midfield, Brandon? Midfield, um, I, I do like the thinking. Um, it's definitely outside the box, and I do kind of agree with that whole idea of if you're going to put Trent in the midfield, if you're going to be Klopp putting Trent in the midfield, this would be a definitely outside the box point to do it and maybe really uh, kind of show the new manager what kind of uh, player he's got when they come in. Um, and I'd have, I don't know if I can go that way, but I'd go McAllister, Jones, and probably – I would say Sobosly, though Sobosly has been kind of really rough the past couple of weeks. Um, just his ability to deliver the ball, his like technical ability, strike the ball from distance. Like we may need one where he puts one in from 25 yards or something like that. We may just need something to really get us going early in a game. And Sobosly has that little bit of magic in his you know tiny feet. Um, that's who I'd probably go with: McAllister, Jones, and Sobosly. Though I do like the outside the box thinking of Trent moving to midfield to play with Jones and kind of really doing all that technical work. I, I agree they're more likely to go with Soboslai to play that right central midfielder role as opposed to Trent. But it's just for me, I've got this romance of the end of Klopp's career. He, he plays Trent and and brings home the Europe, you know, the Europa League and the Premier League by making this massive tactical masterclass. But I doubt it'll happen. Paul, you you've got your thinking on this. Come on, give it to me. If you remember the last. Last week, uh, we had 70% possession, even though we lost 3 nothing. I expect us to have the bulk of the possession again tomorrow. So for that, I need uh, the overload in midfield. So I prefer to have Trent at right back, but he would be spending a lot of time in midfield. I would not start Endo. So basically, I would have Trent and uh, Maka. Maka would be the six. So Trent and Maka with Trent inverting would be more like a double six yeah. or a double pivot. And then ahead of them, you have two other midfield players. I, You know, I was tempted to go with Jones, but to be fair, Curtis Jones has not really been looking that good since he has returned from injury. Post-injury, he was, sorry, pre-injury, he two was, games. Yes, but he has not shown me anything in those two games, James. <laughs> right? He has not shown me anything in those two games. At yeah. least almost like turned up in the first half. He had a couple of a chance that he missed. But I would probably start um ahead of those two. Mm, I would probably start Harvey Elliott. Because I I never like Harvey Elliott as a wide um, right winger, but mm -hmm. Harvey Elliott just behind um, Salah at the number eight spot is a very attacking option, and especially if we have Trent and Maka behind, and then whether you want to start Jones or Sobasly, it, it's you know either. But I want to see I would start Harvey Elliott and have Trent inverted into that midfield from right back. So you. Your midfield three is Elliot, McAllister, and either Jones or Soboslai playing left central midfield. Correct. Okay. I think we're, we're in the bones of agreement. It's just I'm doing something a little bit crazy, but really we're playing the same players. Right, but because you want Trent to be in the midfield, which is yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I want him into the midfield too, but not necessarily as a midfielder. You know, when we're in possession, yeah. it was it would be camped at the base of that midfield, which is what we want. I and I completely agree. I I, I yeah. also think he can make a lot of. I think he can score. This this is one of the things I've really liked this season about the progression of um, Gomez is his ability to invert and almost play as a nah. second defensive midfielder. He he's done well in a lot of games. He's struggled in some more recent, but he's done well in terms of. Um, Helping us defensively with the lob to across the back and stuff like that. I, I think he get the the problem is the final third. He should he, he he can't progress into the final third. But that stopping the counter and pace and everything like that, I think is a great player. And I think it depends if you want to play deep, i.e. Trent plays deep and sprays it everywhere, or whether you want Urge to do that job 
and Trent's more further forward, just putting the ball where he wants to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I, this is the thing. I, it's 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 up for Klopp to make those decisions, and that's why he's paid the big bucks. And if you were paid the big bucks, Brandon, and you're creating a front three to start this game now that you're dropping a player here because potentially, I mean, I, I I'll give you. In fact, I'll do mine at the end. Uh, I'll let you start this one off. Who okay. is your front three? Who are you dropping? I'm probably going Mo, Jota, and Diaz on the left hand side. I think that'd be the front three I would go with. Um, Mo just you have to have Mo there, and Diaz of the front has been kind of even past couple of weeks, but you know the, you can't really judge anybody in this team over the past couple of weeks because they've all been kind of down. Um, but the couple of weeks before that, the six, eight weeks before that, Diaz was one of our, if not our best players during that little stretch. So I think, you know, he kind of deserves to start Yota just because he is more consistent of putting the ball in the back of the net. When he gets one chance, he has one goal. He doesn't need three or four to get himself going. Though, I mean, he is coming back from injury. So that is the worry that, you know, we did see him go a whole year without scoring a goal before. So that's always the worry. I think you got to drop uh, Darwin, you know, kind of what you said with Harvey and Dom just let him run towards the end of the game. You can do the same thing with Darwin at the end of the game. Let him come in. If we really need something, creating chaos, creating space with just his nonstop running last 20 minutes of the game. If we really need one more goal or two more goals, that could be another option, but I think it's Yota Diaz and Mo. So you drop in Nunes, Jota coming in at nine, mm -hmm. bit of rotation in the front three. They can appear wherever they want, which is what they do. Um, I think Diaz gets a lot of sla uh, a lot of hit from our fans saying he doesn't score enough goals, he doesn't get enough assists. But actually, if you look at who the main progression of the ball is, you know, from our from the middle of the park to the opposition's um, final third, it's normally Diaz that's running with the ball. I think his main job is that progression, which used to be Robbo. If you think about it, Robbo used to be the one that would fly forward with the ball. It eventually get over to Trent and he'd whip it in and we'd score. Um, Who's your front three, Paul? Are you going to sit Darwin out or is this going to be his redemption day? Is this going to be his big moment? No, I'm starting Darwin on the bench, um, unfortunately. I was, I'm was i tempted to go with, um, to give Cody Gapko a, a, a start, but I think I would just convince myself to, to start, to stay with um, with Lucho. Because if, if Atalanta is going to play man-to-man -man instead of zonal marking, you want the players who can take on and beat their opponents, win the duels on the on the on the floor. And I think Lucho is the one player that we have in the front line that can dribble past one or two players. But I was quite tempted to to give um Cody a, a shot because he has been very active in the last couple of games. He has scored many goals, but I think he has been very active and some of the shots that um darwin has been missing probably cody would have stuck away a couple of them but having said that i probably would go with brandon three which is jota um lucho and mo has to start there's no question about that but before you come in james is this a game because we need three goals minimum to go back with cody gapko as a number eight, so like played four, four um, front, four forwards. I think it's. I think if we are not, um, shall we say, pushing to be level by sixty minutes, I think we end up with four forwards anyway. And I think Gak pose that player. Whether he comes off the bench, whether he starts again, that's a different conversation. But I think he's that player that turns into that midfield stress, slash attacker. I think they what they tend to do is move Nunes out wide and Gakpo plays all like a false nine or like a ten roll mm -hmm. to find space. So it'd be like a four one, four one with, with Jota as, as the nine. Yeah, I mean eventually it will end up as a one and eleven, won't it? Or one and ten with everyone in the box. <laughs> yeah. in. But yes, um I agree. Now Sticking with my rotation idea here, or my rotation craziness that I was talking about, uh, which is the midfield three can rotate in terms of positions and feck up Atalanta's press. The same can be said for the front three if you went with a Diaz, Jota, and um, 
Salah can't not play Salah, in my view. I think last time his stats when he played AFCON were terrible when he came back. This time his stats are, are not great when he's come back from AFCON. But at the end of the day, if you had to put your house on the line for one person to score one goal in one game, you you go with Mo Salah. So I think, you know, whilst I don't think his control, his progression or anything has been particularly good recently, um, if he turns up at 70%, he's still better than a lot of the, well, probably still better than the majority of the At- At- Atalanta team and better than most of the Liverpool players. If he can turn up at 100%, there's a very strong chance we can go through. Um, and anywhere in between could be anything else that happens. But yeah, I would drop Nunes. Again, for my whole chaos theory, if you bring on Elliot, you bring on Soboslai, you bring on Nunes, and you just let the sprinters sprint once you've tired them out. But this relies on Liverpool, one, controlling the ball and not getting caught by the press. And two, not being out of it and conceding the first goal in the first 15 minutes. Because we always concede. And if we were chasing four, we're, we're, we're well up a streak without a paddle. Um, and, and I think a lot of people have said it, you know, in terms of, you know, first 15 minutes, we've got to be tight for the first 15 minutes. We've got to go at them for the first one. What, what's, what's the, what do you think's changed, Brandon? Because we used to be the team that destroyed everyone in 15 minutes and they just had a really easy 90 minutes, you know, once we were three nil up. And now we're a team that goes, go on, have a goal. And then we'll just absolutely batter you for 90 minutes. And what we saw against Crystal Palace, for the first time, it didn't work. Mm-hmm. We, we didn't come back. Yeah. Um, what, what? What? How? How has this happened? I don't know. I have no idea. I can't, like, if you really think about it, it's been two years of this, kind of. Like, if you look at the stretch of the quad year, I think it was like six or seven straight games down the stretch. We went down 1-0. Like, and it's kind of never really recovered because last year obviously was an awful year for us. Um, and then this year it's kind of been the same. What we've fallen behind one nil, what is it, 21, 22 times? Like, I don't know. I've made a silly jokes, amount. Yeah. I've made jokes like, you know, it's nothing easy FC and we only just want to do everything the hard way. But at a certain point, it's going to catch up with you. And right now it's catching up with us at the absolute worst time. You know, you can't, no matter how great of a team you are, you can't continuously put yourself backs against the wall and, think you're going to find that knockout punch in the you know 12th round um i really don't know i think i'm a huge uh, boston bruins fan here in the states of hockey and last year we set records in the regular season of like wins and points and all this other stuff but down the stretch we were winning but playing horribly and then when it came playoff time when the games get better we got our asses handed to us in the first round the record setting team out in the first round because you know sometimes it is better to kind of get your ass handed to you every once in a while to recover. And maybe that's where Liverpool's at now. It's like, hey, it's not as easy as we're down one nil. Don't worry, we'll win this game. It's like, you know what? We need to come out early and really hit them first for once. Because I think coming back constantly when you're not playing well and winning sometimes can breed a little bit of like a not a laziness, but kind of a um, nonchalantness to your game. And I think that's what kind of seeped into this team is that no matter what, we always came back, but now it's now we're not always coming back. So we really need to kind of change what we're doing. Now, Paul, I'm going to give you Paul's comment here, which is by picking such a strong 11, do you think it could affect our performance on Sunday? Um, And Steve's here, which is picking a strong 11 in a dead game means that our players will be injured tomorrow and we lose Sunday title challenge and Europa is out over four days. I mean, I I would potentially counter that with, if you come back from this, you've got enough momentum to see you through in both competitions. But it's a balancing act. Do you go all out, or do you write this off and then just go all out for the league? What 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 do you think of that? Because it's a fair comment and it's a fair discussion to have. Well, the, the beauty about about um about it is that we have five subs, right? So and I always feel it's better to start and go for it, and then if it's not working, then you you, you use your subs wisely. Than to try to say you're gonna go with a you know a weaker team, then you find yourself leading one one or two nothing. You need another goal or so, and then you're trying to big on the big to, to bring on the big guns with, with 20 minutes to go. So we have to take it literally one game at a time, meaning the gaffer have to pick his best eleven and focus on tomorrow's game. We can't be thinking about Sunday right now. 
because we unless we unless we don't care about the Europa League, which I think we do care because we want to win it. I think we have to go with our best eleven. And as I said, if at half time it's not working out, then you take off your big 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 stars and put on the kids. But we have no choice but to go for it tomorrow. So you know, I I, I think. But and you know, as you as you were just talking about what has happened to us over the last um, couple of games, where you know we're struggling. I don't know. Um, we have been accustomed to one style of football on the club for the last six, seven years, and I think it might be, you know, it has caught up with us in a couple of ways. One, this hundred miles an hour high intensive intensity football. One, it costs in a lot of injuries. And two, teams have devised ways to play against us, especially lesser teams, right? And lesser teams who decide to sit back and to counter, you know, and to absorb the pressure because we don't seem to have the ability to break down these teams. So I think... Maybe we should be concentrating and switching to a more a possession, boring style of football where you where you actually wear down these opponents, pass them to death, rather than trying to go this hundred miles an hour. Then you're countered, then you get tired, then you get frustrated, and then you can't score. So I, I think our style of play against these lesser teams have caught up with us. Okay. Yeah, I, I get that. And... I think I think we had a similar problem last year when we when we didn't do great in the league. Um, we had our style of play. Uh, everyone sort of built a counter to it. Everything was with regards to how do you get in behind Trent because obviously Trent's moving so far forward. And then they started to do the inversion and started to apply that approach. And I think if you think about a couple of years where things have struggled, Klopp's come up with a solution, hasn't he? Brandon, to solve this problem. So someone works it out, we come up with a solution, we finish strong. I think what's interesting this season and probably different to some of the others where we've struggled is the problem has hit right on the period of time where we've got to be at our best. We The dip in form couldn't have come at a worse time. Like we, we It almost feels like we're Arsenal. Like we're, we're dropping at the, that, the Arsenal moment of, of the season. And, and it, that doesn't feel right. But I, I think Paul's right. People are building plans for gang press and clock press and how we do it now, aren't they? Yeah. Um, I feel like you're trying to lead me into the uh, Trent playing midfield is the switch that we need to do. I think that's where you're trying to lead me. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea what you're I'm not, I'm, not that, <laughs> I'm not that pro it. I am pro it, but I'm not that pro it. Yeah, the, that's what I've been thinking about, like uh, reading the chat or just reading, you know, if you go on that hellscape that is Twitter. Um, two weeks ago, we had the greatest team of all time, and every single player was like the greatest players ever put on a Liverpool shirt. And two weeks later, we're having whether we should sell almost every single one of them and just or that MRM or whoever wants to come in the summer wouldn't want to play with this squad because they're so bad. And it's like two weeks ago, this was a team that was be every manager's dream, uh, how quickly the game can change. Um, yeah. It, Klopp obviously has the tactical nuance to switch something and change something. Um, I think if, say, we had like a, the title kind of in hand, as in if we won out, we win the league, whereas right now it is Man City's to lose, and we kind of know how that usually goes, um, that we probably would not be going that hard for tomorrow. Like, because, you know, it would be we're focused on the league. But right now, like, I kind of feel like Europa is the better chance to win a title because, as we know, uh, Man City is just ruthless this time of year and they'll probably put six past Nottingham for us on the weekend and be up four nil at 20 minute mark and all of our hopes of Origi winning us a title is gone so I don't know um yeah I feel like this is definitely the time for Klopp to really throw something else at the wall I'm starting to really dig into the trend the midfield thing so uh, you converted me here James don't, don't you pin this on me. I mean, if you go in our group chat and you say Trent in midfield, Damon will have Damo tomorrow. Obviously, anyone who is against Trent in midfield, jump on tomorrow when Damo's on and hosting because he is adamantly against it. Um, I think, I don't think as a DM, I think as a right central midfielder, basically more attacking. So he's, he doesn't have anywhere near the same defensive responsibilities. But we will see. I have another one for you, though. Go on. You're talking about Trent in midfield. So, 
is Summer Sly's best position is left sided number eight? Why I'm asking that is I've seen him a couple of times play for Hungary. It's, it, and he either plays as a left wing, left winger, or a 10, just behind the, 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 the number nine. Yeah. Um, so he doesn't have much defensive responsibilities when he plays for, for his country. And it seems to get the best out of him. Now, is it, is it a possibility that we are not utilizing Sabasly in his best position? Uh, I would agree with that. I think Liverpool midfield traditionally is a very water-carrying midfield. And by that, I mean they produce ammunition for the front three. I, you could argue, probably, fairly, if you, if you think about it, um, Soboslai could very easily be our left winger. Yep. He can play very similar to Diaz. He's very, very quick. He's like crazy quick, but he doesn't get a chance mm-hmm. to use it in our midfield because mm-hmm. he's being used mm-hmm. as a um as a water carrier. He's been moved mm-hmm. to progress yep. the ball up to give it to the front three. And I, I have nothing against Liverpool's style of play when, in the midfield. They'll never get all the plaudits and everything. McAllister's getting a lot at the moment, and rightly so, because he's finding passes that no one should. Um but it's that type of player that Liverpool will get someone who f- who fires the ammunition to the front three. There is a very much there is an interesting argument, I think, um, and, and I, I'm just looking at the chat to see how much abuse I get for it. There is a, an argument where is if you sell Diaz, you've already got the replacement in Sobosla. I agree with that. Um, and then right that, and then that. That would create a spot probably for Gavin Birch because Summer Sly is a better player than Gavin Birch at the moment. But Gavin Birch, in my opinion, is a better ball carrier than Summer Sly. He's a better dribbler, right? Summer Sly is not a dribbler. He's a, he's a workman like player. He has a very good shot on him. You know, he's a big physical guy and he's quick. But he's not the kind of player who would who drop his shoulders and glide past uh, an opposing defender. So probably Sabasly out on that wing, that left wing, with with uh, with Gavin Birch just behind him in that number eight spot, you know, could be something that might is worth at least exploring. It's a really interesting idea, and I think um, Sabasly reminds me of, and, and I'll, I'll give you an example which will, will connect to, to to Brandon's secondary sports, which is, reminds me of Happy Gilmore. Like he's not brilliant at everything but man god what a shot like when he hits he hits it and he can cross field pass it and and you can do that on the left wing you can take more challenges you can take more risks i actually think him and nunes together could be formidable because everyone would be worried about when they're going to hit it um and i also think him being over six foot if you've got trent playing in, in right back or as a right central midfielder you've got someone that can win at the far post with nunes and then if you add Jota into that front three, it's just the ghost. Like I'm assuming Salah, I'm still assuming Salah leaves the end of the season, by the way. Um, you've got everything that you need in a front three, which is a really interesting dynamic. But yeah, and, and Gravenberch is that box-to-box player. And he's got that great first touch, hasn't he? Like sometimes he doesn't t- take it with his first foot. He takes it with his second and just switches direction. Something Tiago does all the time. And I really like that, like how he can just find himself space just by touching the ball um have we got you on board with this one as well brandon summer slide in the front three not for potentially tomorrow but maybe next year oh yeah i i think sobo is like one of those guys who can kind of thrive anywhere i think if you even put him at center back he could thrive i think he's just that kind of naturally good at like athleticism wise like it would be perfect like left wing would be phenomenal i think he could open up nunez even more if even if you keep salah who seems to pair well with nunez salah sobo and Nunez up top, maybe Nunez would have no choice but to score 35 goals a season because he'd have so many chances to score. <laughs> yeah. And and lastly, I don't know if you guys remember, we played, I think it was Burnley away when we beat them 2 nothing. when Van Dijk scored like midway the first half and then we didn't seal it until late when um, I think it was Darwin who lost the ball, win the ball, and then make that pass over the top to, to, to Summerslide. 
Go and look at that goal again that Sabasla scored to make it 2 nothing against Burnley away. Playing on the left wing, where he control it and hit it with almost in one action. I am convinced that's, that is his best position. He's definitely got the pace for it. He's got the strength for it. It'd be a really difficult difficult problem for left backs or right backs even um, and he's right footed so again it's that coming in and striking it if you've got a left back as Robert I mean there's logic to it um, now I'm going to ask chat and you guys the same question to sort of round us out and then we're going to do score predictions at the end a couple of people in chat have just been like write this off it's a dead rubber just play the kids, play Dan's, give him an opportunity to play in Europe and stuff like that. Just do a few things like that. Do you think we should write it off? Can we score three goals? Can we score four goals? Because, I mean, we potentially need three, but maybe four. Do you, do you write this one off and just go help, help a bent for the Premier League? Or do you go all in and risk, like Texas Hold'em, all in? All in on every hand until the end of the season. Brandon, what are you doing? Are you, are you folding this hand and then going all in next week, or are you going all in every hand until the end? Going all in every hand. That's the only way I know how. I'm an American here. It's like, uh, you know, I'm going to cowboy up every single time. Um, no, like, we're Liverpool. I don't ever want to see kind of like, yeah, this is dead. We're, just go out there and not worry about a game. I want to win every single game we play. Um, I get why we want to go for the title, but like I said a little bit earlier, like, it's not in our hands. We can go out there and give every single game we got and win every single game 5-0 the rest of the way and still not win the title because City wins out. So um, I still think this is our better better chance to win something and go for it, go for everything. It's Klopp. Go for everything with him while you got him left. You know, Try to create some more magic that he's already created so much for the club. Try to give another great moment in the Klopp like kind of aura that is around Liverpool. So I, I would go for it personally paul go for it or fold and well, go for it in for the premier league steve's pretty much go for the title bin off tomorrow um where are you well outside of bradley and matip i think it's safe to say that this is the healthiest we have been as a squad um for quite a while so I think we need to go for it and then reassess the situation at halftime. At halftime, we should know where we are. Obviously, if we're in with a decent chance, then we continue. If at halftime it's not there, you know, we haven't scored or we've given up a goal or whatever it is, at that point, then the manager can say, you know what, who do I need to, to, to give a break? And then you make your substitution. But we we have to go for it. Be sensible, but go for it, and then we see what it, where it takes us. I'm in agreement with you both. Um, I, I I would say momentum needs moments, and moments don't come better than an opportunity to play 90 minutes when you're behind. If you can do this, you've got momentum for the rest. If you don't do it, it's not over. Um, but you don't have the same momentum. So you, you're going to seek your momentum in a different situation. Who are we playing that we can really build momentum against? Fulham, it's not really a momentum builder unless we go behind again. But again, we're, we're so numb to that now. It's just like dead inside when we go 1-0 down. I Yeah, for me, I'd say go for it. Momentum is comes from moments and I think if we score one before in the first half and we get one at 60 minutes and we're 2 nil up I think they'll crumble like that you've got to remember this isn't Liverpool we're used to European big pressure situations I think there's a strong chance that we, we can push them around but we need to kill their crowd and the only way you can kill their crowd is by smashing them in the first 15 minutes and the one thing we're terrible at is doing anything in the first 15 minutes so that's probably going to be the the, the key I, th I think you're right Paul I think it's almost you throw an audible at half time knowing what's going to happen you either protect people mentally or you put the accelerator down and get them and, and use the moment um, and I, I also want to say I don't think Klopp knows the meaning of like kind of surrender 
yeah, he doesn't know the meaning of it because, I mean, we were up 5-1 against Prague coming home, and he started a really strong squad against them again. So, I mean, he doesn't know the meaning of kind of, oh, we're going to take it easy for a game or something like that, or we're going to kind of phone it in. Like, we'll go for it because we, of course, we are. That's who that's who we're led by. Yeah, and even if we don't go for the Europa, we still might lose to Fulham. We're struggling anyway. Just do the best you can. If you can score an open play, use corners, get penalties. Like, as, as we saw last night... We, um, with PSG uh, and Barcelona. Was it PSG Barcelona? I can't remember who it was, but someone got sent off. Yeah, oh, right, yeah. Just, boof, momentum all changed. And, I, you know, one of the moments I remember from the Crystal Palace match, which unfortunately no one will talk about because we were terrible, is Diaz ran past two people and then knelt next to one and then ran to the centre of the park and was just cruising yeah. If we'd have won that match, that would be all over every social media. It would be like, oh, Diaz making fun of people. But if he does that to someone and they two-foot him through the ball, which is very likely to happen when someone's making fun of you, you never know. And I think, I think, uh, yeah, I'm in agreement with Sweet. Um, you know, Steve saying Klopp surrendered the first leg. I'm not sure, but we, we, we do as we do. Um, now, we're going to finish with score predictions so if you think we're going to if you think we're going to wave the white flag and give it up you know is it going to be a nil nil is it going to be a are we going to go all out for it is it going to be like a four three are we going to concede first what's going to happen give me your score predictions in the chat we'll, we'll ping them up there but i'm going to start with you paul because i'm not going to give brandon the opportunity to to go off on it i'm going to i'm going to see where you're at what what's your score prediction four one liverpool penalties Advance and penalties. Oh, that's going to create us problems for Fulham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what are we going to do? <laughs> Brandon? Always believe in the boys. Um, 4-0. Darwin scores four goals in the last 10 minutes of the game. Charlie's head explodes in the chat. It's going to be an absolutely epic time. <laughs> Charlie would explode in the chat. Uh, I'm going to score four goals when our shooting cut things can change <laughs> you gotta believe i it i think it comes down to this do salah and jota turn up tomorrow and i think if salah and jota and i say and not all turn up tomorrow i think we can do a three nil and we can take it to extra time and i think we can do them in extra time so I would say 3-0 with a goal in extra time because I think we would have broken them mentally. And I, and I, and I mean score late, like the 3-0 mm. happens in the 90th minute. But that would require us to properly turn up. Um, and I would say that I'm at 50-50 on it. I'm completely honest. You know, fans need to be loud. But have you seen the little mm. corner of, you know, the stadium that they get? It's, you get more seats at a bus, bus station, to be honest. Um, I have a question for you, James. Well, Steve believes in faith, but not blind faith. We ain't scoring four. <laughs> I have a question for you. So, I'm predicting we go to penalties. If after nine players on each side is taking a pen, yeah. the next one score, yeah. next pen score and we have only two players we have not yet taken a pen is the goalkeeper and gomez have we raised this, raise this in our chat okay the next so, pen scores who do you want to take it um <laughs> now there's a great video that's done the rounds i don't know if you've ever seen liverpool doing um set piece training and joe gomez just strolls in having a laugh and just puts like all of them miss and stuff like that, and he just bangs them all in the top bin. But I, I don't think he's good in a pressurized situation. I would give it to Allison. Mm. Allison is a mentality monster. Um, and, and and it's nothing against Joe Gomez. He's just I, I scoring and him are, are the biggest mental block. And I think until he scores, it will be his mental block. And I don't necessarily want to put my mortgage on Joe Gomez banging a penalty. I would I would put my own money on Allison. Simicast won us a penalty shootout, and he's not a goal scorer. You remember? <laughs> so, yeah, but he is a set piece taker. 
So he, he like he takes it. So he, he's got the whole process of how I go up and strike a ball. It's not really Joe Gomez's thing. Mm. Whereas Allison takes goal kicks and knows how to just run up and lamp something. I would give it to Joe. I just say, you know what? Just just go straight down the middle. <laughs> I would say, Steve, if that's how you how you want to do it. Please give it to the food banks or something like that, Anfield and stuff like that. If you if you're gonna put a bet on and, and yeah, and, uh, if you're gonna put tenner on Liverpool, getting four, I, I would say if you were gonna give a hundred quid something, give it to the food banks at, at Liverpool. We don't need it on the stream or all like that. But um, I, I I want us to, and I'm, I'm not gonna write it off. We've scored four goals in many a game in our in our history, um, mm-hmm. and we need to. Um, I'm going for us to score three. So I'm not going for a score for I think extra time is completely a different ball game in its entirety. Um my my biggest problem is not us scoring four goals. We're gonna have enough shout chances for us to score four goals. My biggest challenge is do we give them a goal? Well City is behind at home. <laughs> Good. Come on, we need we need City and Arsenal to win so that we can have five players, five teams from the Premier League in the Champions League next year. Gomez will score in the final. Just <laughs> in all my dreams, and, and this isn't going to happen, but in all my dreams, it's the final day of the Premier League. Mm-hmm. They will pull a draw in. They need to score to win the Premier League. Like the full Aguero moment, but Joe Gomez from thirty-five yards. That that that's what it's that's what's destined to happen. Yeah, I, I would stop being a footy fan. I'd be like, I'm done because it's never going to be better than that moment. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I agree. Completed. I, it. We're done. I wouldn't give. I wouldn't even watch football for one year for that to happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, Matty's always said this: if you're not going to believe, what's the point? Yeah. You go in with hope. And then if you're disappointed, you're disappointed mm-hmm. if they match your expectations. But I, yeah, uh, I'm I mean, going in with hope more than I mean, expectations. Bra- Brandon, is, uh, are you a Red Sox fan? I am not. I'm a uh, Cincinnati Reds fan. Okay, because a few years ago in the in the, uh, major playoffs, the Red Sox were down 3 nothing, yeah, wait, three games cool. to nothing in a seven-game series. That's never happened before that a team down 3 nothing in a seven-game series. We came back and win four games in a row against the Yankees. Yeah, and they so, got they got beat like nineteen to eight in one of those games. They got absolutely yeah, battered on their right. Head. So the moral of the story is it's sports. Yeah. So you know we have to be optimistic. Mm-hmm. If not, why are we even being a fan? Yeah. And like uh, James said, like we've won plenty of games scoring three or four goals. We've been through worse uh, runs of form than this. So I th- I think uh, really it's it's not the most impossible thing. It's a big ass the way we're playing, but I think this could be very much a get right game. And that crystal palace game might be something that could readjust heads and maybe just find some shooting boots. I always do the same thing when I think about, Oh, this is never going to happen. I look at our starting 11 against that AC Milan starting 11 in 2005, a team that no one had the right to beat and no one should have beat. And we were three 0 down at halftime and we're, we're saying, can we score three goals in 90 minutes? Yes, we can. We create 25 chances a game. Depends who they fall to. Like I said, I believe Jotter and Seller have got to be in form. But we have the ability. We have the team to do it. Um, we we are, you know, the better team on paper. And I say on paper because they definitely played well. For some reason, Gamaka looked like a good striker, but we left loads of space. Anyway, not going to go over that again. So, we've gone for us to do it. Um... Steve saying we beat AC Milan because we had Stevie G. Well, we've got Trent. Let's hope that he can have that moment. Let's hope that's his breakout moment. Let's hope it's in midfield on the rotation. Let's hope that I'm right. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you very much for Paul and Brandon for joining us. This has been the miracle in Atlanta. Will it happen? Will the chat is split. Some think it might. Some think it won't. Tune in tomorrow, and then we'll have a post-match reaction with, with the team. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll catch you on the next one. Take care.